Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, drummer for Cher, Marilyn Manson, Foreigner, and many more, Jason Sutter. And now, Rich Redman. What is up, everyone? Another episode of The Rich Redman Show. As always, well, this is a new thing. We're coming from sunny Los Angeles, and my co-host, man about town, co-producer, longtime pal, Jim McCarthy, is joining us from Music City, USA. How you doing, pal? Yeah, it's stormy Spring Hill. <laughs> is it I'm, stormy That's today? where I'm hailing from. Yeah. Is it raining today? It's heat wave. We need some rain. Yeah. For sure. Sorry about the sunny and 70 over here. Well, you know. <laughs> but hey, Jim, over the years, you've heard me talk about this guy. I've probably been friends with uh, our next guest for probably a decade. We've been on each other's radar forever. And then in the last five years, we've become really fast friends. And um, he, I mean, he really needs no introduction. As a world-class drummer, he's played with the likes of Marilyn Manson, Smash Mouth, New York Dolls, Chris Cornell, Foreigner. To say the least, that's just the tip of the iceberg. My friend Jason Sutter, what's up, buddy? What's going on? How you guys doing? Thanks for having me. Yeah. Oh, yeah, of course, man. I recognize that patio. Now, Jim, if you've ever seen a picture of 50 drummers with a couple of musicians sprinkled in and maybe some fashion designers um, standing around a pool, it's usually Jason's backyard. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> we did have a blowout last year. It was a pretty, pretty amazing birthday soiree that that took on a life of its own i have to say so i want to come out for the next one you got to come out you got to come out in the year what is it 50 what is it 52 yes (laughs) so i think sutter and i are like i think we're like uh 54 week um we're like yeah 54 weeks apart Uh, that yeah that's right yeah we're we're like 54 weeks apart almost a year exactly yeah, man. So how you been handling this uh, quarantine thing? You, uh, some people are, it's usually people are not in the middle. They're like, I hate it. I can't wait to get back to work. And other people are like, I'm reading all the books that are on my nightstand and I'm practicing and I'm doing yard work. What's your, wh- how are you handling this? I'm doing lots of yard work, but um, I honestly, for me, I, I feel like, you know, in a way I'm trying to be positive with everything. Obviously I was on uh, in the middle of t- t- on a tour with Cher and we were in, um, we were actually at ground zero in, in um, Oklahoma city. When this all went South, we were about a week into a two month tour. And, uh, and when we came home, so, and then we were supposed to have a, a, a whole other batch of months at the end of the year. And that all just got like uh, with, with a few Vegas runs in there. So um, I'm trying to just be positive about the whole thing. I think that's really all you can do and try to look at it as like a reset or, you know, that's the most positive way I can look at it is a chance to kind of take a break because like yourself, you know, and probably a lot of musicians who are friends of ours, like you set yourself up to, if you can, be working all the time and that's the optimum. And, and then we both been pretty lucky, you, me, Riley, you know, a bunch of North Texas guys who were, you know, careful what you wish for. We've been working nonstop. So for me to take a break like this, it's like a chance to, you know, regroup and and force myself to be home which i i'm rarely here and so it's a chance to kind of enjoy it luckily i'm in north hollywood california which is really pretty and beautiful and um i i dig my place i've kind of set it up as a kind of a quarantine situation where if i was stuck here i'd be pretty satisfied with all the <laughs> all that i have here to do and um, so it, it, for me it's not it's not that big of a bummer it really is and i feel really satisfied with where you know the amount of work up to this point so in a way it's just kind of like okay there's nothing we can really do uh so i'm trying to be positive there's nothing you can do about it so i'm trying to be productive as productive as i can here and that doesn't really include playing drums as much because i like i said i feel like i was really satisfied with that part of my my world up right up until this all happened so for me i don't feel the need to run to a practice room um because i've been kind of doing that my whole life to get to this point. And now it's kind of like, like I said, it's, a, it, it's we're kind of forced to, to regroup. So there's nothing I can do about that. So running to a practice room for me doesn't seem like the first logical thing to do. It's more <laughs> a matter of something else, you know, anything yeah. else. And, and reading, you know, and, and a lot of other creative things have, have come into it. But um, 
But yeah, I'm trying to be positive, you know, because there's yeah. nothing I think there's nothing I can really do to change that outcome of the at least the touring situation I was in. Yeah, in the last three years, you've been uh, the drummer with Cher, and then on little breaks in between her gig, you're like instead of going home to North Hollywood, you out on the road with Joe Perry. Tell us about the last three years. I mean, it's been insane, actually. In, in about a week, it'll be three years with her, um, which is hard to believe. That's incredible. You know, Mark Shulman, our mutual friend, was so cool, and he had a conflict with the share thing with Pink. He had been doing both for years, and for the first time ever, they conflicted. So he reached out to me and said, hey, would you be in doing this? And, of course, for me, I'm like a, you know, don't tell anybody, but, like, I'm a huge fan. So, uh, you know, for me, it's this has been, like, an amazing experience. So, as you know, well, you, you've been in a gig – and in Nashville, I think that you guys tend to have maybe if a gig works, it goes for a while. But in LA, it seems like gigs, a gig to last three years is like a, you know, a lifetime. So to, <laughs> this is, we're coming up on the three year mark with, with her for me. And that's something that I'm really just over the moon about the fact to getting to make such great music with her, um, with such a great group of musicians and then the, the whole cast and crew and the dancers and, and of course, Cher herself is just an incredible human being. So it's a really, it's been a really, really, really uh, incredible last three years. Um, yeah, I did got to do the Joe Perry project um, with Joe Perry and Brad Whitford of Aerosmith, which is, you know, incredible. And then Gary Sharon from Extreme was, this, was singing. And um, Dave Hull, bass player, is on all the bunch of Buddy Miles, early Buddy Miles stuff, um, who also played with Joe Perry back in the 80s. And uh, Dizzy Reed on keys from Guns yeah. N' Roses. It was just a super band, and uh, it was just a super time. And you get to play all those kind of deep cut Aerosmith stuff, a lot of Joe Perry Project stuff that I was a, a fan of. And so, you know, it was it was that was an incredible experience as well. So, you know, I can't complain. Right before the share thing, I was doing D. Snyder. Did a whole yeah. summer. European festivals opening for Aerosmith on a few of them. So, you know, that was really cool. Dee's a sweetheart and a, a legend. And, I, you know, I was grew up in that 80s hair metal thing. So the last three years has been pretty great, man. It's been pretty great. Musically, I just, you know, from Dee Snyder to Cher to Joe Perry, it's like these classic, iconic, you know, yeah. figures. So I can't complain, man. I got to say it's been it's been cool. You know, that definitely yeah. helps coming into slowing everything down. Amazing. And with, and with a, you know, Jim, I mean, don't you think like a background like that, a resume like that, you're hopping, you're playing double bass with Marilyn Manson, paint in your face, and then you're playing, you know, pop rock songs with Smash Mouth, and then you get to be a New York doll for a summer. I mean, you would think, what would, what would you think that Jason's background would be like? Self-taught guy in his parents' basement playing double bass to records? Or would you think that he was a classically trained musician with a master's degree? Well, being that he's from Potsdam, is it Potsdam, New York? That's correct. That's correct. When you think of Potsdam, you think of versatility, all right? At least that's yeah, what absolutely. comes to my mind. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, to, to adapt to all those situations, I mean, Potsdam is the home of versatility, as everyone knows. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you're, on a real, you're on a real kick today. <laughs> I was actually looking up, you know, the different background. And you that's just, my new, I bought some you kazoos, just play a kazoo? man. I mean, Actually, Potsdam, to be fair, it was a small, it was a college town. There were three colleges there. So I actually, in a weird way, that is where all that kind of diversity did come from. I know you were joking, but it's a college town. My dad was a professor there, at, head of the art department at, at uh, Potsdam State uh, University. And there were two other colleges. So there were tons of bars, tons of bands. And this is in the 80s when I was kind of growing up. So I actually got to play in like I was at, when I was a senior actually when I was a junior I was playing in probably five different projects and actually working on that whole diversifying and playing you know in different putting myself in different situations from a blues band with old cats with cigarettes hanging out of their mouth yelling at you not to rush to like you know the college band playing with a bunch of seniors playing like missing persons and Joe uh you know um you know just different different you know, pop songs, I guess, Joe Jackson and things. And, uh, and then from there to like a total cheesy pop band where I'm playing electronic Simmons and we're playing like the Hooters or, you know, yeah. the Alpha, you know, that, that dances in like dive bars. So I was doing a bunch of different stuff. So it's pretty funny that that, that is where actually a lot of, I think the, the original drum set diversity kind of stemmed from. And I was taking lessons. There was a great music school there with a great teacher named Jim, Peter Zach, yes. who was my teacher since I was a little kid. And so he was friends with my father. So that worked out great because he ended up teaching 
Dave Weckl down the road and uh, Vinny Caliuda working on his hands a little bit. So I got to have that kind of a uh, you know, magnitude educator early on. So yeah. You got that, that. You got that early on, Jason. It's almost like, it's almost like you're, you know, there's certain guys that are destined for greatness. You know, you, I mean, you probably had a five to 10 year jump on your other colleagues because not only were you getting all the rudimental training and all the technical things that you would need to succeed at a collegiate level and in life, but you were getting all this experience in the trenches. And there's so many people that have one or the other, but when you can marry those things, it, it's, it, it's a really incredible thing. Yeah, it was incredible. It was really, when I got to college, I had played for about five years straight gigging. I was negotiating contracts. I was negotiating personalities from this guy to that guy and, and knowing when to, to speak up and when to sit in the back and be quiet. And, and all, of, you know, all by the time I was 17. So it was, it, by the time I got to college, it was like, okay, now I'm going to put all the drum set stuff on the side and I'm going to go big on the, you know, drum line and marimba and timpani. And I really thought like, okay, so I really didn't play any drum set in college, hardly at all. I didn't gig on the side. I wasn't, I was playing drum set in jazz bands, you know, like, like we were doing that, but I wasn't gigging out because I already kind of felt like I had done a lot of that. And well, that's, um, yeah, that's, I mean, that, that's great. And you know, it's so funny as we talk about that North Texas connection of like me, you, Jim Riley from the Rascal Flats, um, you know, your, your, your Luke Adams is and your Blair Sintas and all the guys, the Adam Gust, all these guys that are in LA that came out here to make their fame and fortune, or they went to Nashville to make their fame and fortune. And the commonality with all those things is music education. And the fact that we're a product of music education and, and, and Jim and I always like to mention and thank our sponsor of the show, the school of rock. So, um, Jason, imagine at that age being able to go and like academically be in a curriculum, you know, at five years old, these kids from five to 18 are playing in groups and they're learning songs and they're learning bass and guitar and drums and how to sing and how to front a band. Most importantly, they're learning life skills about how to work together, how to show up on time, how to set goals, how to take direction. And for the parents out there that want to get their kids involved with the School of Rock, there's 250 locations. But in Nashville, we have two of the best. It's Angie and Kelly McCray, my friends. I've known them for a decade. Jim, what's the email addresses if the, those parents want to get their kids involved? Nashville at schoolofrock.com and Franklin at schoolofrock.com. And tell them that all three of us sent you and you will have right. a great, great time. And I know they're socially distancing. They're getting in a room. The kids are putting on their masks. They're sanitizing and they're playing the Trogs and they're playing uh, the Hooters. They're playing all the stuff, all the the bands, the Stones, the Beatles, put up a bunch the of Rolling sneeze guards. Stones. Uh, you know, I just, yeah. Did you ever play behind sneeze guards, Jason? Yes. You know, the, have, for the chick singer? I've only, I've only had to do it once. It was one of the worst experiences of my life. But Thank I you. know some dudes, their whole career, they, that's what they do. Or wow. some singers. Um, I know that you can do partial ones. I've seen, you know, like certain cats were just the symbols. But I, when I was playing with Chris Cornell, we, he put out like kind of like a record that was produced by Timberland. There was like a lot of like hip hop elements. And I don't know why, maybe we moved the stage set around. I think instead of maybe behind uh, him, I was off to the side. And for some reason, somebody thought it would be a good idea. And I don't even know who, because I don't think it was actually him. But I, I did end up doing, I think, a month and a half or two months of touring with a full. And a lot of people don't realize when you're doing that, first of all, there's no air flow. So it's kind of this stagnant feeling. And then second of all, it, it sounds different. You know, the sound bounces off. So normally the beauty of an, an acoustic drum that resonates in that beautiful hole that you're playing in kind of comes back to your ears and you get this full feeling. It just stops right in front of you. And so no matter what <laughs> you do to tune your gear, so it's, yeah. it's a pretty brutal experience. I don't know if you've ever had to do it, but yeah, it was. But luckily, I mean, we were playing some gigs. I remember playing in Canada and people had signs. And it was like, let him out or like tear down the wall. You know, my, my, awesome. my people were, you know, I mean, I never stressed that I hated it because I can go with the flow and I thought I'll try this out, you know, but it was awful. And it, and I remember one day Chris turned around and said, yeah, like, let's lose that thing. And that was it. So yeah, it was a short lived experience, but <laughs> I can say I survived. I did it. Nice. Yes. Then now, so, growing up in New York, did you ever get down to the city at all occasionally? All the time. In all fact, time? I have a great photograph of me, which is no longer there at Manny's Drum Shop. You know, I think it's on yeah. 
And all those great drum shops, people don't, maybe a lot of like, people didn't grow up in that area, but in New York, there was a whole street of music stores and there would be like the main music store and then upstairs was the drum shop. Um, I think Marco Ciccoli worked there for years. He's yeah, a rep. Marco. For, you know, yeah, so, um, but he was there for years and he talked to cats who were from New York or, and they would go in and hang with Marco before and now they're professional drummers and they would, I, I, you know, we kind of joke about how that felt because it was this mega music store compared to where we were from. Oh my gosh. And uh, so I did get down there a lot and that was always fun, but it was, it was also just an energy. My father was a sculptor, so at a really young age, I mean, I have pictures of me and my twin sister, like, home, you know, Super 8 videos of the two of us on the street corner were like two or three. It looks like a Scorsese seventies film, you know, like the grainy and the car it's like taxi driver looking, you know? So my earliest memories were New York and it was, it was not pretty, but it was really exciting. You know, yeah. it was scary and there was an energy to it. But I remember, you know, going with my dad, we'd go down to set up shows at different galleries and, and I've since gotten really into collecting art. And so going back to those galleries that were all in West Broadway, which are uh, in Soho, which most of them aren't galleries anymore. They're clothing stores or, but there are still some galleries. I think all the galleries are now in Chelsea, but it was a, it was a really fond memory. So to answer your question, yeah, I did, we did get down there a lot. So New York has always been like, uh, you know, it was kind of like I was living up in the country and uh, at the same time I had this New York experience. My godfather lived in Columbus circle. So we go visit him and I was eating Ray's pizza when I was, four years old and going, why does this pizza taste so much better than any of other pizza I've ever had? New York pizza. Yeah. It was just, yeah. So I was experiencing the stink and the smell and there was still like hookers and pimps and like for real, like, you know, the dudes good old like, days. <laughs> yeah. It was garbage <laughs> everywhere. It was pretty crazy walking down that street as a little boy going like, what the hell is going on? And why are we here? And, but I have to say my dad, I think it was, you know, I learned a lot from, going there one-on-one -on -one with my dad, he would take one of us at a time and, and we'd go as a family too. But, you know, it was an experience of like, you just, sometimes you just got to just jump into it and you can't be worried about everything and you can't worry about everything around you. You got to just, you know, live life. And, and that was the lesson I learned from, from that experience of, you know, instead of being freaked out by everything, I just kind of embraced it and, and, and became part of the scene rather than outside looking in. I felt like right. eventually this is my New York city and you know i'm part of this and then and then that any fear or confusion and honestly i think that is a pop you know has helped me relocate and become a musician where you you move to a new area and eventually you say you know i'm part of this scene now i'm not outside looking in i'm actually part of it so it was a really positive experience growing up and of course i, I miss that new york even though it was stinky and spray yeah. paint ugly and roaches and garbage i miss it you know there was a real <laughs> giuliani <laughs> yeah, it was just real. Yeah, um, it was real, and there was there was music on every corner, and art, yeah. and comedians, and actors. Uh, you know, working on scenes. Yeah, it See, was I a lot. The, it's funny that all three of us. We, I mean, Rich grew up in uh, Milford, right? Yep, Jim's you're a Canadian as well. I grew up in Danbury. If you're wow. familiar with Danbury, Connecticut, of course. And our local music store was the East Coast Music Mall. You ever hear of that? I don't know that. Okay. I don't know that. When were you there? Like during the 90s and 80s and stuff? Me or Rich? Yeah. You, Jason. Because that's, cause that's, you know, I'm, I'm in New York, you know, in the right. 80s. Yeah. But for Connecticut, I know Pepe's Pizza. Yeah, New you Haven. Know, I, oh, that's yeah. what I think of when I think of pizza. I don't know about music stores, but I know the, the pizza scene there is pretty incredible. Oh yeah. Well, oh, yeah. well, that had to be pretty cool, Jason. That you had like a very kind of a uh, forward-thinking, creative, artistic father that was like just kind of threw you into the deep end of the pool, and that probably wasn't uh, discouraging you from from uh, you know going into the arts because he was in the arts and he kind of seemed like he straddled the line between um, education, art, and commerce. And but what about your mom? Was she a homemaker? What did she do? What did your she mom was do? a nurse? She ah. was a nurse. My mom. So, my mom too. Yeah. But years. there was definitely a big creative scene and everybody was very welcome to be part of that scene. And there was a, a lot of really artistic, cool music, cool characters. Like it was a really open, free, um, academic and, you know, kind of just a really, really, uh, I, I think it was a really positive environment to be as a musician, you know? And yeah, my parents, my dad was super, you know, he wanted to be a sculptor and be famous in New York. And, and I think, you know, he could 
he could relate, you know, to, so he was very supportive. Yes, for sure. Yeah. yeah. It nice. was always yeah, definitely cool. You know, it was like, you're going to be cool. You're going to be all right. You know? And, uh, you know, same thing, just jump in, you know, get into it. And yeah. And it, it worked out so far. So good. You know? So I was looking at your timeline, Jason, your timeline with your career. Um, and it seems like it's typical, like people will have their hometown and they will go to, if they go to college and get their higher education, they kind of like become part of that scene. And then they have to make that decision. Where am I going? Am I going to New York, LA, Nashville? And it seems like you were in Dallas and for your uh, bachelor's and then Miami to get your master's. Then you went up to Boston, right? Right. What was that period like? Well, that was, it was completely bizarre. It's almost like fairy tale type scenario, you know, as a, as a little kid, you know, we're in college, we have no idea what the path is to, you know, go from A to B or get that career or whether you, most people were young, we want to be in a band and then, you know, from there. Uh, but for me, I always kind of wanted to be a freelance um, person. So while in grad school, when I was playing in those bands in seven, when I was 16 and 17, I, one of the bands was a college band. We would play up in Potsdam called a, it was called a beer blast. And they would get like 20 kegs. They might even have an, like a pig roasting and they would have like theme shirts, tie dyes, and they would just be sororities, fraternities getting drunk. And they would literally fence in this huge front yard. It was really unlike anything I've ever seen. And uh, everyone would kind of commingle. It was really social and they'd always have bands and they usually sometimes two bands. And, uh, I remember playing one of those and a friend of mine, dear friend of mine named Dave Gibbs, who I ended up working on Rock of Ages, the musical with, um, which is crazy, back in 2005. Um, he came and saw me playing in this band. I was probably weighed like 50 pounds and I was skinny, rocking out. And Dave came to see the band that I was playing in. He watched me. He went, wow, that dude has knows what he's, he's got it. He's a, you know, he could see at 16, I kind of was half baked and I had this, form and I was kind of already doing it and he remembered that Dave remembered that so four or five years later after North Texas right in the, towards the end of my graduate uh, second year of my graduate studies um, I ended up Dave recommended me for a couple gigs there was Tracy Bottom and Julian Hatfield both on major labels in Boston and uh, Dave said you know you sound like this you sound like this guy Stacy Jones and I, I remember watching you play you look like him um, what if I, you know, I, I, they're looking for a drummer. They want to play with this kid, Stacy Jones, who now plays with Miley Cyrus and, and has done tons of great stuff, American Hi-Fi. And right. Baruch Hassan. Anyway, long story short, he said, you play like Stacy. If you came to Boston, you'd probably get one of these gigs. And so I flew up there, thanks to those guys, the management for both those guys brought me up. Uh, audition, I ended up getting the gig, which right out of college, it's kind of things you dream about, you know? And I had to make a decision, do I finish my master's recital and get my master's degree, or do I go rock while I'm being called to do it? So I chose the latter, went up to Boston, played with Julianne. I got in a tour bus, my first tour, played on, I was literally playing on Conan O'Brien, which at the time in like 2000, in 1995, Conan O'Brien was like the biggest thing in the world, oh, yeah. you know, as far as his shows. So I'm literally going from practicing my timpani and my marimba or playing in the big band, the CJB at Miami, to literally two weeks later, all the kids, Kevin Stevens, one of our buddy drummers, just sent me a picture of there was a huge party going on at Miami. And these kids are all watching me play on Conan O'Brien. <laughs> they had like a party for one of their buddies, me, to, you know, to watch me playing on late night TV, which is just bizarre, the thought of that, to go from literally in a practice room at college to literally being on Conan O'Brien playing for like 7 million people or more viewers. So yeah, it was yeah. a really unusual, crazy transition, you know? And then from the Julian Halfield gig, I ended up getting a, getting a, a gig with a band called Jack Drag, where, where we signed a publishing deal, signed a record deal with A&M Records and, and put a record out, which was a really satisfying thing. So right out of college, I got a lot of really cool experiences. Yeah. Uh, it was pretty amazing, you know? Yeah. I remember when I was 17, man, I couldn't even do my damn, wash my damn underwear, buddy. I was just, yeah. you know, I was just like in El Paso. My mom took care of everything, was in practicing. And then I was like, went to college. I was like, man, I got to figure out how to live, do yeah. all this stuff. You know what I mean? Which nobody ever tells us how to, how to do that. You know, I was talking to Kevin Stevens, who, you know, our, our friend, mutual friend, and I was at Miami. Nobody, nobody in college as musicians 
I think there was a blind optimism. We were optimistic that we were going to become rock stars somehow, right? We, we knew that would happen somehow in our mind because we had Modern Drummer Magazine and that said, like, if they can do it, you just, you, you just got to follow their path and you can do it, right? right. That was a naivete that kind of thank God we had that. Whereas now young players, I think, are all like trying to, you know, much more educated on how to, how to network and how to work thanks to the internet. So it's kind of an interesting thing. But no, I guess nobody ever, I just think back to it, nobody ever told you what to do. There was no one telling you where to go or what to do. Do you go to LA? Do you go to New York? Nobody ever told you that. You just kind of like were expected to just figure that out, which yeah. is scary, you know? Yeah, I, where I, you yeah. are planted. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's definitely like nobody, there is no, you know, there is no blueprint, you know, but. Yeah. I mean, and back in the day we couldn't even like, you can use the internet now to kind of like crack a door and then you could use it to actually, you know, create that synergy to actually meet someone in real life. But back in those days, we just had to blindly crash parties and give people our demos and go to diff auditions and free gigs and hope that it all worked somehow. It's amazing that we got gigs at all. You know what I mean? Like when I think about that was our system, like what? Like It was a shot in the dark, but at least we're, at least we're really emphasizing that human connection. You know what I like to think of? I look at like a resume like yours and the, uh, the, di the diversity. Um, and I'm thinking to myself, yeah, what are the rules we talk to, um, to kids that want to be successful, the next generation? And we talk about, you know, dressing well, be the first one there, be the last one to leave, have a firm handshake, look people in the eyes, be over-prepared, be able to take direction, you know, play well. Those are all a given. But something tells me along the way that you figured out the way, what is the deal in dealing with a Marilyn Manson? What is the deal in dealing with the front man for Smash Mouth? What is the deal with filling in someone else's chair in the New York Dolls when someone was sitting in the chair just right before you, right? You have to learn these things pretty quickly. And yeah, how do I mean, it exist I, in those microcosms? Honestly, there's a bunch of ways I've watched different people handle situations that are professional. And, and you got to remember, like, I joked that, like, um, say a gig in your, in your case, and we've talked about it, you know, where you're playing with one artist for over 20 years, right? Which is mind-blowing to me. I just said, like, I did three years with Cher, and that's, like, insane. But <laughs> the navigation of that is very unique. You have to, you know, you guys really know how everybody works. And, but in my case, so often, I joke about, like, I, it's not just playing drums. It's not just learning the music. It's not like being consistent and playing the parts right and looking right. All the things you said, but also, you know, every gig I do, I have to start brand fresh, brand new. When I join, when I come into the Joe Perry project, I'm literally, and I joke about, it, I call it meeting the parents. You know, it's like dating some girl and then you guys get serious. You have to meet the parents. In other words, you don't just get her, you get everyone around her. Right. Well, same with an artist. Say when I go from, from smash mouth to, Marilyn Manson. Now I meet an, I meet a manager. I meet his girlfriend. I meet her friends. I meet the bass player. I meet the guitarist. I meet all their people. And then I meet a tour manager. And then I meet the production. Then I meet and all these people. And then when I leave that gig, I start all over again. Whereas, say maybe with the Rascal Flats or Al Dean, where you've done these, you guys have done these gigs for many years. A lot of those guys are similar figures. Or when you meet them, it's it's very subtle. Or more like they're meeting you. You're not meeting them. They're the new right. guys. For me, I'm often the new guy where I have to meet this whole sea of people and I, and I have to navigate all those personalities, even down to like the bus driver, which a lot sure. of young players and people don't realize there's so many personalities that go into that and how you carry yourself and navigate can, can make or break a tour as far as it being fun or, or not and your personality. And to go back to your question specifically with someone like a Manson, I've seen two different ways of doing it. I do it a certain way where even at North Texas, there was like a microcosm of when you meet the head of like Dr. Shatrum or Ed Sof, our professors there who are very, you know, very famous, but very ominous as well. You know, they're, 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 <laughs> very, they're very, um, you know, they're, very, they're, very, they're present, you know, they, 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 their, their reputation precedes them, you know, yes. uh, but, you, but they have respect. And I've, I've noticed there are two ways to handle any situation, say when you're new to a gig or even an audition or a Marilyn Manson, one way is to come in cocky and be super cocky and be like, I got this and you know, you got it and you're, you know, extra puff out your, you know, and then another way is kind of like to be the like, you know, yes, sir, you know, you know, please, you know, like kind of bowing first and then slowly you figure out your situation. I tend to go with the latter. I tend to come into a situation and I'm like, 
I'm like a sponge and I try to really like kind of keep my head down. I try to be as humble and chill as I can. And then once I get to know everybody, then I can kind of change that a little bit. I'm not saying I'm like pretending to be one thing, but I think it's better in my experience and even at North Texas, it seems like the guys who came into North Texas and went up to Doc or Ed Sof and went like, yeah, I got this. So I'm going to tell you how this is going to be, Mr. Sof. And then you're going to do what I need you to do because I'm not paying for you. And I'm, it, that never worked. In fact, that was like, a, <laughs> that, was, that was not how it was done. And I yeah. tried to come in and be like, you know, I, I guess my point is I want to prove myself musically and I want to, you know, and then I want to, you know, kind of, I, I, to me, that, that is my goal. I'd rather be known by the playing first, and then we can go from, from there. You know, I, I tend to, when I come into a gig, which is, I think, pretty unorthodox, I don't ever ask how much I'm getting paid. I never ask, you know, any details. I assume I have my own hotel room. I assume there'll be per diems, things like that. But I'm not as particular about how much money I'm getting as to if it's a gig I really love. And then, you know, that usually works itself out once we discuss it. I prefer in some cases actually play a few gigs before we nail that down. Sounds crazy, but in some cases to me, that way the music does the talking and that helps dictate your your price or your demands financially. So that's how I try to go at it. It's, I know a lot of other people may not use that method, but that to me has helped me kind of navigate the personalities I'm about to, and, 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 uh, and, you know, encompass or, or come in contact with as well as also, you know, when I'm meeting the family, all these other, you know, people, this periphery that comes with the gig that a lot of people don't think about. Young players just think, oh, I got to be able to play good. I got to have good gear. I got to have some chops and I'm good. Let's go. Let's learn the music. I can play to play. We're done. There's so much more to it than that. And that will dictate whether or not you enjoy yourself or you don't. One last thing with Manson for me, that was at that gig. I came in and I was the first, according to him, freelance drummer or session drummer he'd ever had where I had other gigs before him and I would, he would assume I would have other gigs after him. So he only had a certain amount of like power over me. He knew that I could just leave and get another gig. I'm not saying other players in his band couldn't, but um, in some cases they were more beholden to him and then he could be creepy Manson and throw things at them. I didn't get things thrown at me and he made it clear to me because he knew that I, I would just, I had an option. I would go do another gig. So that helped me in that. Um, and also I feel like, um, you know, I feel like, yeah, I feel like that, that, that attitude kept me kind of safe, you know, kept me kind of. Just, just your, and that's Manson right there. He's calling. He's, <laughs> we're going back to work. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he said, Hey, I'm going to, I'm not going to throw any microphones at you. Well, you know, we're good. You don't have to pet plane. Uh, yeah. I mean, the drums weren't safe. The drums were destroyed nightly, but the manager was a great manager and he bought my drum set from me right away. And I started calling Ludwig and saying, Hey, you need to send me extra bass drums, extra rack toms. Cause they were just getting punted off the stage or smashed with microphone stands. And That's crazy. So, yeah, that kind of happened, which to me was fun. man. I, I embraced all that shit because it was so rock and roll. It was such a spectacle. Some shows he'd come out and be so high, he would just fall to his knees at the end, like midway through and just start throwing up. And it was it. We'd keep playing and he'd keep throwing up. Eventually they'd drag him off stage. It was like, and that was a satisfying show for a lot of the audience. That was okay because they, they knew that they wanted a certain amount of chaos, which you would never get with your average band. So, so wait a minute. Was there some shows that he came out and he threw up and there was no show? No, I mean, but there was definitely, like, you can see clips of it where we're playing in the middle of a song, and he kind of starts, like, throwing up and literally doesn't, like, can't stop. Like, and this, we're still playing. We start the song. He sings, like, a verse and then literally throws up through half the song, and then we literally play the rest while they pull him off stage. Like, there were many spectacles like that where the chaos was part of the show and the audience expected a certain amount of that. So to me, in a way, it was like reminiscent of, say, like 70s rock shows, like maybe where Steve Tyler would come out and sing three tunes and then like pass out, you know, <laughs> and it was still, but it was rock, but it was rock and roll, you know what I mean, where you'd never have that with other gigs. Um, so there was an element to that, that chaos was actually really fun that, you know, um, there was something about it where I can definitely say, like, I'm probably never going to do anything that more rock than that. And it was at a great time in my career where I was still able to enjoy it. You know, but I probably wouldn't want to do it again at this point. I'm 
Man's unplugged. Spoiled. Oh my yeah. god! Yeah, you guys probably never did any acoustic shows with him. <laughs> no, that did never did not happen. But you well, know, that would I, be I hilarious, joke, though. I joke each one of those gigs is like a, it's like another degree. Like I have a degree in heavy metal from with from, you know from Marilyn Manson, and I have a degree in you know. So each one of these gigs to me is like another little experience that I can kind of throw in my. And that was a physicality, double bass, and and certain type of playing a lot of triggers, things I hadn't done a lot of before. So for me, that was an experience where I'd learned, you know, I kind of had a whole new bag of tricks after that. And also for me, it was a challenge. So like my mantra was to stay on the bull, you know, like when you get into like a bar and you get on the, the mechanical bull and, you know, it's like, you know, you just stay on that bull. That was my goal. No matter what he threw at me, literally or figuratively, um, no matter what experience, that I could be professional enough that I could keep the gig. And that was my goal. And when it ended, it was like, there was like a little moment of triumph. Like I did it. I mm -hmm. stayed on the gig. He didn't Good fire me. Though. I didn't quit. Cause people were getting fired and quitting all over the place, you know? And I was just like, I'm going to stay on this bull. I'm going to make it. And that was a two year gig, which for him, that's like, you know, it's like 10 years, you know? So in yeah. dog, yeah. Took, yeah, took about eight years off my life, but hey, I made it. Exactly. <laughs> Woo! So, Amazing. I mean, would, he, would he start like just throwing up and halfway through the show or just towards the end? It varied. It varied. I mean, anything, anything could happen. And, you know, it was like war. Things were flying around the stage. You'd be playing and, and you'd hear this smash of a cymbal and I'd look up and you'd be on like, these crazy stilts and he'd have these huge like extended crutches and he'd just be smashing my cymbals while I'm playing and the crutches coming within like inches of my face. And, you know, it's like, just, it was just, it was like war. Yeah. And, you know, he had, a, he had a quick change area where he'd go quick change and I, the drums were here and the quick change was like right behind me and he'd go in and he, you know, the girls would put, change his makeup and put on the mask or the, the Pope outfit or whatever the hell, right? And, and the minute he'd walk in there, it was just like profanities, you know, because he's so amped up in the middle of the show. So he's just like, God, I'm screaming the whole time and I can hear all that. So there was just like an energy, but I, I, it was kind of funny. Before every gig, I would come out early because they'd have tunes playing and I, I was, well, wasn't in the house and they'd be like, you know, preparing the stage for the apocalypse, like torn newspapers and garbage and they empty stuff on the stage and get into fog machines. So I'd come out and I'd do like five minutes of just like double bass, just by myself, just, just get my feet warmed up. And then the last five minutes before he'd walk on stage, I just played brushes, like ballad brushes. And, and cause I'd be sitting there when this, you know, cause basically we were under a kabuki, everyone was set. To just and relax, was, you mean? Like get yourself in the right headspace? Yeah, or? just to get in the zen zone. I just like, just play, you know, yeah, just like that. Just Right on cue. Right on cue. From LP, the zen box. The get Dharma at, drum. Get one at your Coming soon. Guitars. The great That is the Dharma drum. I'm taking it out to Joshua Tree for my 50th. I'm gonna I play love naked. it. Naked, like McConaughey. Dude, that's amazing. You, the, the, the jackrabbits and the tortoises love you. A fine glass of champagne. I heard that. Uh, I heard that that uh, Jason Momoa is filming out there right now, and is he really? He, and he took over. Uh, like this, a buddy of mine wanted to go get pizza, and uh, went went by, and I wrote him. I said, "How is it?" He said, "Momoa's here in Joshua, which in in I think it's Flamingo Heights, where this it's called Giant Rock Pizza. It's also coffee. It's a great place. You should." Check it out. But anyway, I guess he just took it over and was like, you know, they literally had eaten all the pizza that they had from this film crew and drank all the beer they had. And they were literally having to go to other pizza places and bring it in. So, wow. Yeah. Joshua Tree is kind of crazy right now. It's a whole scene of like people, I think, descending on it to escape LA just for a change of scenery. Yeah. Which has been happening, obviously, because of Coachella, but it's pretty exciting to see all these yeah. different people heading out there and in mass to kind of get that vibe, you know? Yeah, wear the masks, folks. Wear the masks. The Rich Redman Show will be right back. Well, our big tagline has been inspiring kids to rock on stage and in life. We changed it, actually, to inspiring the world to rock on stage and in life because when kids are here, 
They learn so much more than music. They learn how to be on a team. They learn responsibility. They learn to take responsibility for their actions. They learn to organize their time. And we try to teach them, you know, not to be that person that nobody wants to be on a tour bus with. <laughs> Connect with School of Rock today. Search School of Rock Franklin or Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. Jason, tell us about um, D. Snyder. He seems like a nice guy. Down the, to earth. The sweetest, nicest dude. The first day of rehearsal, we had one day of rehearsal, and then we had a gig. And uh, we rehearsed, and he took us all out to dinner, like a really nice Italian restaurant. It was really important that we all sat, you know, as a band in this outdoor table. It was just it was intelligent conversation. Um, Tanya O'Callaghan was on bass. It was one of my dear, dear friends. He's one of the best bass players in the world, playing with Steve Adler right now. Adorable and super sweet. But the, he, he's extremely intelligent yes. and sweet. And I realized at one point, I'm there with the band. I think it was four of the band members. We're talking about everything but music. We're talking about intelligent, cool conversation. And I realized, wait a minute, it's just us and D. There's no manager, no schmooze, no assistant. It's literally the four band members and D. Snyder. And we're just having this amazing conversation. And, you know, he's married to the same woman. She's a doll. You know, he has grown kids. I've never met his kids. I'm sure they're great. He's the sweetest, most genuine dude. You know, never drank, never did drugs. Now I think he drinks a little wine, but it's like charming. He is the sweetest. He's so positive. You know, he's into his 60s. He looks like a million bucks. There's no body fat on him. He's like eight feet tall. <laughs> Always a smile. Always, Always a smile. A positive, yep. Always a positive attitude. And, you know, I have to say one common thread I found is playing with a lot of older rock stars who've been in the business forever and maybe past their heyday mark and now they're on round two or whatever, three, four, or maybe they're still in it. They're, they're, they take it for granted. So many of those artists, or I'll, I'll tour with a band like, say, Motley Crue, where the Dolls open, for, it was Dolls, Poison, Motley Crue, and I'll watch these guys, and they totally take their career for granted, whereas you think of how many millions of people never made it through that 80s thing, who dreamt of having that. These guys were at the peak their whole lives, and they regret it. It's almost like they, they, they don't get to enjoy all that they've had. And someone like Dee Snegger, so refreshing, Chris Cornell, same way. They just so appreciate the fact that they get to go out on stage still. They appreciate every single fan. They still sing those songs like they were, they were as important to them as they wrote when they wrote them. And that, man, is just, it's so refreshing to have that environment. And Dee was always like that. We'd be doing these throw-and-go festivals for like 50,000 people. You couldn't even line check in a lot of them. And his attitude was fine. If the he never would raise his voice. If the monitors were terrible, he was expecting the monitor to be terrible, and he was going to sing through it. He was going to give that audience a great show. He would never in a million years dream of yelling at somebody because he couldn't hear himself. He's just going to power through, and he's thinking about that audience 100% from the first body to the very last at, say, 100,000, you know, festival in France or something, you know. It was inspiring, man. He was a really, really sweet cat and like a very family oriented, treated us like family. Nice. Great singer. I just can't say enough great shit about him. I really can't. I mean, That's awesome. he's that he's that cool. He's that good of a dude. And 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 he, you know, he liked like someone like Joe Perry. They treat you like they're lucky to be playing with you. That's, that's, awesome. that's like, holy shit, that's professional. Yeah. When you're playing with someone like Joe Perry and Brad Whitford, who literally have probably been playing guitar longer than, uh, you know, together in a rock and roll band, longer than almost anyone in the world, you know? And these guys are this tour de force team with this band that's changed their lives numerous decades and numerous eras. And those cats literally were so humble and I swear always made it known that they were, they, they felt... The, the appreciation, I, I, you, could, you could cut it with a knife, the appreciation they had for getting to play together. It was, that's incredible, you know? Incredible, no. you don't get that often, yeah. So yeah, that's man. like, note, note to self, that's, that's a rock star. You know, that's how you, that's how a real rock star. I, I, got so, I got so close, man. It was like me, uh, me, you, and Shulman, you know, this, we have a nice little brotherhood. Uh, we were all kind of playing with Damon or flirting with Damon at that time. And he was like, you want to play for D Snyder? I was like, yeah, I got a break. I can do it. And I wasn't able to do it. It always works out some, you know, between Nashville My and, and LA. Too. 
it was one of those weird things. And sometimes, yeah. and, you know, and he went the sure thing with Mark. It almost looked like it wasn't going to happen. Like he could do that. And same with the D thing. It looked like Mark could do more D segments. And so I was like, okay, I'll do it. And then, you know, so for me, it's always a gift when a gig come, when a gig like that comes through, because like yourself or like you were saying, or, or Mark, there's so many other dudes, you know, you just, to me, it's like, you can't, you, um, I guess like they don't take things for granted. I don't, we don't take things for granted. Right. Because it takes so many factors to make it so that gig happens. So, yes. and I was just talking to Tanya recently and we would just, we played all these European festivals. And it was so much fun. Such a great vibe, you know, really incredible. Jim, what have you always wanted to ask a um, rock star drummer? Well, I mean, the D Snyder stuff is curious to me because uh, he was in radio for a while. He did a morning show in Hartford. Yeah, that's and right. I heard a lot of great things, similar things to what Jason is saying, uh, especially the smile. Uh, a friend of mine worked with him, and he says he just smiles all the time. And uh, I mean, it's like it was, you know, it was the hotel. I'm, I'll never forget we were in the hotel, and it, yeah, I was new to all this, so again, I'm just kind of like watching. And D said, "Hey, we're gonna go get food. We met in the lobby." And then the restaurant's like we're on we're in South Beach in Miami, where we're playing this private party with some other band, maybe Slaughter or something, and. And we had to walk like a good like five city blocks down South Beach. You know, I don't know what road that was, but like a long way. Popular people, it's hustling, bustling. It's a Friday or Saturday night. And Dee Snyder is like seven feet tall, blonde hair. He's totally identifiable. Um, <laughs> and we're walking down the street and every single person that walks by him, every car knew it and would say, hey, Dee, like they knew him. And he'd shake their hand, keep moving, shake their hand, stop for a picture, keep moving. It was very gracious. You know, it was really interesting. I was like, wow, this dude, like, he's so undeniable. It's like a lion walking down Main Street. You know, you don't, you don't miss it, you know? That you can pet. Yeah. <laughs> um, Stay he hungry. Doesn't he doesn't bite. Um, it's so funny because his persona is so that's such the antithesis of that it seems he's it's, and he just takes the piss out of himself and the whole band and the whole rock star thing and it's just it's it's adorable he's yeah. he's, he's definitely a, adorable really cool adorable yeah. jason what advice would you give someone from any walk of life that's trying to accomplish something a, a creative somebody trying to start a business somebody trying to to uh, accomplish their goals? What, what, what's the, what have you learned all these years? Well, I mean, for me, man, it's definitely tenacity. You know, it's like anything, the longer you stick around, the better your odds. If you, if you split after, if you come, come to LA and you say, I'm going to give myself five years in LA, and you're, there's a good chance you're already cutting yourself off at the knees. You really got to say, if it takes 20 years, I'm sticking this out. And I found that. I've watched it with so many other areas of not just music, but all the arts. The people who really stick with it, who dedicate their, their whole being to whatever the art form is, um, whether it's being a writer, a painter, a musician, the people who dedicate themselves and really commit, uh, they're the ones who I see you know, are the most successful. And that, that's, that's you, me, and uh, all of our buddies who, from college. Um, but it's amazing how many people I see, so many younger people, the going gets tough and they, you know, they don't stay on the bull. You know yeah. what I mean? And, um, you know, you don't get a lot of chances in this business, you know, and that's the other thing, I think being overly prepared, you know, really prepping, preparing for that moment, you know, making, you know, uh, every, every effort to be as well versed and well prepared in whatever your art form is, so that when you're put up against these other people or these other options that these these artists can choose from, you're going to be, I joke about it, it's like the three bears or, you know, like the Goldilocks story of like this bed's just right or that bed's too hard or you want to be just right. You want to be the person that can adapt to the situation. You're prepared, you're, and you're comfortable enough with yourself because you have done your homework that you can represent yourself freely and not be nervous or tense or, you know, scared. Um, there's nothing wrong with being all those things, but you can present yourself without that being the forefront. You can present yourself as a musician first and then, you know, kind of, uh, you know, overshadow those other emotions. But that's a tough one. I mean, for me, again, I, for me, it has been diversity, diversify, kind of ties back in with all this. Um, and you got to really love it. You know, I think Dave Weckl said a quote once, you know, if you don't have to play drums, if you don't wake up in the morning and say, I got to do this for a living, mostly directed at younger people, then change courses. Don't do it. If you're not 100% 
I can't, I'm not going to do anything else. This is it. Then don't do it because it is, it is, this business is going to have ups and downs in any business, no matter what. Yeah. If you're a fireman, if you're a cop, or if you're like a musician or an artist, you're going to have highs and lows in your career. But for musicians, it's usually real high and real low. Either you're doing, <laughs> you know, you're having the time of your life tour in Europe with a great band or you're waiting for the phone to ring and you're watching your bills pile up. So, um, I think there's a fine line there too, but I think, you know, having a positive attitude, being positive, you know, I always believed that there was a gig around the corner. And at the, I always remind myself if I had a, a bout of like depression or that moment where you're like, God, is this, this, should I become a lawyer? You know, I'm, I'm like 35 and you know, I had a great gig four years ago, but now it's been a while. I, I would force myself to just kind of a little mantra. I would say to myself, there's a gig around the corner and you just have to get to it. And once you get to it, all this attitude is going to change. And it, and it did. And it kept happening every time. And every time I would go through that cycle, I would have to tell myself, there's going to be a gig around the corner. And a year from now, you're going to be going, wow, how, I can't believe I was thinking about becoming a lawyer or getting out of this business. And there I am on a tour bus again. And, and literally up until this hit, I was still doing it again. And, and, I, and I never, ever, also the last thing I would say is just don't ever take it for granted. You know, once you get one of those gigs, don't take it for granted for a minute, you know. Um, and I think real stars like someone like Cher, who really I think is the pinnacle of, of the artists I've played with, who as far as originality and as far as like professionalism, and to have a career that has spanned as long as her career has, we, we, we all know in the entertainment industry, that, that doesn't happen. Um, and I think so much of it, when I watch her, she takes this as seriously as she probably did when she was, she was a little girl and she's, she has fun with it. She never lets it get her. She never is angry. She never is, eh, you know, or it's somebody else's fault. It's always her fault. And if she's not performing great, it's on her. It's not, you're not, it's because of you. I'm not, or, and you see that a lot with a lot of shitty artists and, and people who, and so that is also another thing I've learned is really, it's like you can control your destiny you know you really can you just got to tell yourself that so again i think it goes back to staying positive it's okay. kind of all over the map but i wasn't ready for that no it's but. good stay positive there's a gig around the corner i mean that can apply i mean especially in these troubled times where people like their whole lives are kind of unraveling and you know a lot of that uh you know i talk to jim about it a lot but you know when i speak to corporations, I say, look at you people are all self-employed because at any moment the ax can fall and you are back on the street. So we're all entrepreneurs, you know, essentially, especially us drummers hunting and gathering for our, our, uh, our meals. Jim, what, um, what's the random question of the day, buddy? I got, I've yet to find one. It's uh, to qualify what you're saying. I think that a lot of people need to understand that they got to build, uh, you know, their stool with three legs or more, meaning, you know, they can't depend on one job. They got to, you know, find other areas of income and streams of income to make sure, you know, as we've recently seen 35 million Americans all of a sudden lost their job and they've got nothing coming in other than unemployment, which is about to run out uh, next month. So that's something I mean, to that, really consider in this day, in this day and age. What you, I mean, that's a whole other topic, what you're talking about, you know, which I agree a wholeheartedly. I mean, for me, I love a lot of other things than just drums too, you know? So to me, it's exciting to do, other avenues that also can be, you know, make, you know, earn revenue. But it's amazing. I, I remember having coffee with a buddy of mine and I was going over like diversifying as a career, not just being a musician, but being a musician, being involved in many other facets of money making. And I remember just talking to the guy, he's like, man, I, I wish, I wish I could, but honestly, I, I just, I just play drums. That's it. That's all I want to do. And I just thought that was interesting because for me, drumming is a very important part of my life. Um, but I also really enjoy doing a lot of other things, you know, and I've tried to study a lot of other things and, and I'm constantly learning. And, and uh, so to me, going with what you're saying, Jim, is having multiple, that also leads to having other methods of, of, of in, you could call insurance, but other methods of, of acquiring money, you know, and other, other, other areas where you have business acumen that can help kind of pr pr provide mm -hmm. if you're in this if one of your income streams suddenly dries up you know yeah. I'm, so. I'm friends with a lot of teachers on facebook and they're all you know they're trying to figure out and navigate how it's going to look for them going back to school now <clears throat> a lot of them don't want to go back to school excuse me i wouldn't want to go i mean i was a substitute teacher when i was trying to make it in nashville so i'd play yeah. into the clubs till three in the morning and be in front of that class in my chinos at 7 a.m 
but we didn't we had the flu we didn't have covid you know yeah. well i mean that's well, that's kind of what they're worrying about is you know what's it going to look like when they go back to school and you know their income is kind of they're, they're they're basically trying to figure out where to go and a lot of the you know it's like there's an opportunity to be explored here that if more and more people are teaching and wanting to stay home with the kids tutorship i mean there's all there's a whole bunch of opportunities to be explored that they're just not thinking that way you know right so there's no question it's going to change a lot of a lot of things how, how business is done you know obviously um you know touring you know what will come back first will it be clubs will it be arenas you know it's really it's kind of mind-bending you know it's kind of crazy to think about but like i said for now i'm not racking my brain too hard because i don't think i'm I, that's not that doesn't fall under my job description as far as trying to figure out how to get this back it's when it's back you know then i'll kick back in but it is it is tricky man it's scary but, but you know i mean you also i mean of, among us musicians you have the um uh, you know probably the reputation for being the smartest with your money ever like in the history of the world i mean you're interested yeah. in architecture you're interested in art and those are great things that they bring you great joy and you also can kind of monetize them you know me i got the gift of gab and I am not shy, so I'm able to make money off of that kind of stuff, you know? Absolutely. So, you know. I call it buried, it's like buried treasure. That's what I refer to it as. So, you know, whether you buy Bitcoin and maybe that appeals to you because you're on a technical side or you get a tip and you throw a few grand that way and all of a sudden Bitcoin becomes a real actual investment. Or maybe your parents, you have a family history of stocks or bonds and you, you have a, a way to figure that out or that excites you or, um, or fine art. For me, fine art is something that I enjoy. I always want it at my own little museum. And then on top of that, it turns out it, you know, it can, you know, gain uh, a certain amount of value. And so to me, uh, it could be musical gear too. You know, I just sold a bunch of snare drums I had that I collected over the years and you know, I paid for them. You know, a lot of these drums are rare handmade drums. And, you know, I want to support certain artisans and support it, you know. But then now I'm realizing, you know what? I haven't played these drums in years. Now's a good time to get rid of them. It's like buried treasure. I invested mm -hmm. in them. They made a little more money. I let them go. Now that I'm not working right now, a lot of gear that I just don't need. Um, and so to me, that's like a small example of buried treasure. And then the other thing is buying homes, which excites me. And I... You know, I thought, you know, I got to have a backup, like what Jim was saying, you know, some other income source. And for me, I, I wanted that passive income of, of rental properties. And so, you know, bought in Nashville in 20, uh, 13 years ago, in 2007, in July, literally like two weeks ago, like 13 years ago, in East Nashville, that nobody was looking at, nobody cared about it. And um, so to me, that was, that's more buried treasure. You know, I, I bought that place when nobody was looking and I just did it in Joshua Tree and that excites me to kind of try to find these places that are on the precipice of going and yeah. getting there before uh, everyone else does. And so that's exciting to me. I enjoy the process of real estate. I have a real estate license. I've sold a bunch of houses to a bunch of drummers that you guys know. And yeah. uh, it, it's very satisfying, you know, to be able to help. But really what it's about is know about houses and to be able to help musicians because so many musicians, it's such a big um, purchase for everybody, but for musicians, and I think musicians sometimes really can't wrap their head around how do I make this work. So for me, whether I'm making a commission in LA where I'm licensed in California, or helping people relocate to Nashville, which I've done a bunch, or uh, other places in the world, it's helpful. It's 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 helpful to have that knowledge, but it's uh, satisfying to see musicians make those smart plays because as a musician, you need a certain amount of stability in a home, uh, at least in the last. I mean. In, in for all of history has been a pretty stable stabilizing yeah time. man it's so it's so nice jim and i usually record at the house that drums built in brentwood tennessee and it's like i like what what i it's bought crazy. this with drums and it's insane paradiddles it's, in, it's insane to think about you know so for me that's a very satisfying feeling i know what you're talking about you know like you bought a home by playing drums and you know you think wait a minute how do you how do you do that do you know nobody <laughs> told us about that stuff when we were young and growing up and so to me that that's sexy. That's exciting. You know, a new this, room. This is a closet that voiceover built. Yeah, that's right. There, yeah. <laughs> it's right. Well, Jim's got that sexy voice. He's got the monster trucks voice. And you know what? 
Sutter, they don't tell us about that. I mean, it's like everybody wants to uh, wants you to get your songo down and your you know your your extreme bop ride symbol and your one handed roll and soloing against clave. But we're doing such a kid such a disservice to not let them know like this is the reality of what's going to have to happen after you get out of these hallowed halls. There should be a agree. class I mean, on that. If you, I mean, I agree. And if you don't have us like the stability of a home, it's going to be very hard to, to make, to stretch this out as rents rise and your gigs come and go, you need a stability of a set income. I really do think so. So that's definitely something to think about, but it is funny that like growing up or being young or even reading modern drummer when I'm in high school and some dude starts talking about, who's really into like, he's been on tour with some big, huge act, but he's all jacked about investing in buying apartment buildings and shit. And you're reading about that. It's like, I don't care about that. I'm, 16 i want to hear about like what ride symbol you're using you know so <laughs> yeah. it's not lost on me that like this kind of talk can be really unsexy to a younger person but to me now this is really sexy so i know there's a time and place for it but to have those homes and that stability it's what helps certain musicians or certain people this kind of be, can be the kind of thing that can insulate them through something as as uh, devastating financially as this so i always yeah. say you know you got to you got to eat your vegetables before you can have dessert, you know? And what I mean by that is, you know, you got to, you got to cover your bases, you know what I mean? And I guess my biggest thing of having the idea of buried treasure investments, however you want to call it, is that so that, and I think I've mentioned this to you, is that so that I can enjoy my career when I'm older. And what I mean by that is I don't want to be the dude who had a great career Played all these great gigs. It was so satisfying at the moment. It was awesome, but I didn't save any of it. Spent it all on whatever. It's gone. And now I'm in my mid sixties. I can barely pay my rent. I can't afford groceries. I'm miserable, and I'm out of my prime. And now I'm going to regret this my my choice, my career choice. I want to be seventy and living the life of Riley because I saved this money. I invested wisely, and I can look back on my career with joy and and enjoy it even. In, into my future and say, yeah, I did what I set out to do and I can enjoy it and I have to mm -hmm. sweat it. And that to me is my, is the number one reason, um, you know, the idea of being a drummer who retires, you know, like, whoa, I, I want to hear about cats like that. A bunch of our friends in Nashville who've done that and they, they're able to retire at a certain age. And that to me is impressive that you could have a great career and you did it well enough that you were able to like, say, if I don't want to do this at this point when I'm older, I don't have to. Nice. Great yeah. advice. Jim, what's your random question of the day? It's the random question, random question, random question of the day. If someone narrated your life, who would you want to be the narrator? Um, wow, that's a, that's a, that's really tricky, man. Um, <laughs> You know, I, you know, as a, as a great voice is David Sedaris. I don't know if you ever listened to his books on tape. That's pretty good. You know, it's kind of like a playful, ridiculous, slightly half joking. Um, what about Sam so, Elliott? Beef. It's what's for dinner. Beef. <laughs> well, I mean, if you were going to go the, that extreme, then you have like the James Earl Jones or, you know, honestly, I think you probably couldn't do better than, um, uh, what's his name? Oh, man, I'm spacing it. Uh, Sesame Street. Um, okay. actor who's been in everything. Frank um, Oz. No, no, no. I thought that would be pretty good too. <laughs> um, be Fozzie Bear. Uh, Morgan Freeman. Morgan oh, yeah. Freeman, the voice of God. It's yeah, it's pretty great. He do he does a lot of documentaries. So That's Jim, right, he does. Back to the trenches for us. Jim Jim's a professional voiceover artist, and I'm a voiceover artist in training. So no, but we got we got work to do, Jim. You know, I mean, you guys, you know, who knows? You got to earn my trust in order for me to say I would want you to That's basically right. be, the, be the voice of my. Exactly. My, you you got to be uh, sold on my elocution. Exactly. I need. Yeah, man. I need Jason a little bit sits more. down to regretfully get on a podcast. <laughs> Jason, so you're so for people, do you like to be found? What's the, I know you have a website. Is it Jason Sutter Drums yeah, or Jason Sutter? Jason Sutter dot com. Jason Sutter dot com. You can reach out and say, hey, man, I had a question about. Whatever. I just gave a lesson to a kid in London who's real sweet. He's, he's an he's a orchestral percussionist, and he wanted to talk brushes, and he just was able to reach out and say, hey, let's do a Skype lesson. So that's the best way if you wanted to do a connection or had a question or want to do a lesson or something via Zoom or Skype, 
just jasonsutter.com and you can go to, uh, you know, send a request. Or, I love know, it. And yes, yeah, support been- Jason with his uh, Regal Tip uh, signature brushes. They're awesome. I Killer love brushes. And you have some mallets. I got some mallets too. They're, they're both blue, so they're pretty, dif- you know, identifiable. But, but I got to say, I, I use the hell out of both those uh, implements with the share gig. It's pretty great. So it's fun at this point to, if there isn't something that's out there, to, to create something, you know, to be able to, you know, feel the confidence to say, hey, I've tried everything and this doesn't exist. And, you know, I, I, I think this would help me get to another level musically. So I'm having fun with that. Looking at your website and your kit overview, it looks like you've put to get kit. the kit together that I've dreamed about when I was 12. I yeah, mean, I'm not sure which, which kit, but I'm, if it's the it's giant. The octopus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, man. I mean, you know, that, that came from necessity, to be honest. It sounds funny, but, you know, Hal Blaine recorded all those early Sonny and Cher and Cher records, and he had that, that giant kit that he had set up just so he could do any session, mm-hmm. any sound he needed. So it, it really kind of came from that. And, it's funny, uh, Willie Ornelius did the gig early in the 70s, and he had a, a big black Octoplus kit that said Sonny and Cher on each bass drum head. Wow. And so I thought, you know, wouldn't that be cool? And I had a few concert times, and I thought, I thought, you know what, if I had a full kit, we're playing arenas, Soundman can control it, it could be vintage sounding when I needed it, and depending on where I was playing in the kit, be more modern. And then, of course, I have an electronic rolling kit for all the the – you know, the dance numbers. So it, it's, I have to say it really served its purpose as a, as a necessity, but also it was, it was like getting to ride like the unicorn, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. getting to like lasso the one that, you know, when I was a little boy, that catalog and the idea of like getting yeah. to play that kit and actually getting to play it in front of a lot of people might really well in a very professional setting. It'd be one thing to like have it in your like Genesis cover band at some bar on the weekend with eight people in front of you. So, but to actually have it be in a very real situation, but that was a process, man. I got to give Ludwig drums credit for building it to the exact vintage specs, Uli Salazar and I got yeah, together really. and went back and, and made sure everything was done to spec. Um, and, you know, it's pretty, it's, I got to say, I, I got my cake and I was able to eat it too on this gig for sure. So do you get to go, so I'm, I mean, I, I would be totally comfortable going, you know, after one practice session going, brat, bru, du, bru, du, bru, right? But are you doing a lot of that stuff? Tons, yeah. tons. And Jeff Percaro did the gig in the mid 70s too. There's a great live in Vegas with Jeff Percaro and, and I think the keyboard player from Toto as well. And uh, they, um, He's, he's got all concert toms, you know, and he's just going for it, you know, just like, but the fills are like these long fills, <laughs> you know, like these ridiculous fills that, you know, I had an eight and a 10 concert tom and, when I, and those sounded so great. And when I went to the regular double headed toms, it just lost the magic. So uh, I figured why not just, Get more of them, you know. All headless. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You don't come across too many six inch toms these days. I'll tell you what, you know, it's it takes a lot of aim. Like you're spotting. <laughs> like I'm over here and I got a thing and I'm just I have to be looking, looking, I'm getting ready for it. And and you yeah, you oh, can't dude, I would be tightening up my butt cheeks so much and whenever I do these Neil Peart benefits or whatever, and there's just like those two micro toms over here and then maybe three here and then two here, it's just like all right, here we go. You know. And and the da, 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 when you do that and they're that small and you get and you're getting bigger, you have bigger. to space up. It's like trying not to hit rims, you know. It's uh it is it, and not to mention just playing the gig literally like my upper body from being stretched out from a ride symbol to a, you know, it was amazing. The uh, upper body, you know, development that I, I, I felt like the strain from playing yeah. this kit, you know, it's, it's yeah, plus a- all those dancers. I can't wait to do some sort of a gig someday with tons of like sexy dancers, because I think I did one time in Branson on the Pam Tillis gig when I was behind the sneeze guard, we had a couple of dancers and I thought it was like, great, but I think the dancers on the share gig are probably much better. It's so, they're so incredible and they're so inspiring. And as human beings, they're also really great. I say that, one of the other things, the cool gig thing with that gig is that I could pick any one of those dancers, any one of the band, and I could go spend the day in wherever we were, and I would learn something from them. 
You know what I mean? Everyone there is inspired. Everyone there has put in all their time since they were little babies into this art form, and they've reached the highest pinnacle. So the, the energy in that room and the dancers are a big part of it is it's a dedication to the art form, like what I was talking about before. You know, these guys, you don't get there unless you've, you've, you've eaten your vegetables. You don't get dessert yet, you know, until you've yeah. done it. It's kind of how Rich feels doing this podcast with me. So I'm sure <laughs> at the pinnacle, yeah. the walk, Jim, you could cut the energy I'm, with a. I'm the dancer a that he gets to watch. So. Jim's a great, great co-host, man of many talents. Well, Jim, I had a great time, man. Jim, yeah. Jason, thanks for coming by, man. Thank you, man. I'm glad this worked out, man. This is uh, excellent, super fun. We're all remote and uh, incredible. Keep it's, keep rocking. Keep technology keep, is incredible. Everybody uh, follow Jason on the socials. Check out his website, buy his brushes, buy his mallets. When this all comes back from the zombie apocalypse, he'll be touring with Cher or somebody incredible. And Jim, thank you so much, buddy, for your time and talent, as always. You're very welcome. And we appreciate you guys tuning in. Be sure to leave us a nice five-star rating. Leave us a nice review. It takes 30 seconds. We're on iTunes. We're on Stitcher. We're on Spotify. We're on YouTube. Tell your friends. Keep coming back for the good stuff. Jason, we'll see you next time, man. Thanks, Rich. Thanks. This has been The Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredmond.com forward slash podcasts.